we borrow it from our ancestors and, and it's here and we keep it better for the next generation. I mean, it's priceless. There, there's no amount of money or monetary value that you can put on having back the bison lunch. Welcome to MCV Cast. That was Rich Jansen with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes on a historic transition on the Flathead Reservation. We'll check in with Rich for more insight on the National Bison Range in a few moments. I'm Aaron Murphy here with Whitney Tani, the Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters, Political Director Jake Brown, and the newest member of the MCV team. Whitner Chase joined MCV a few days ago as our organization's new program director. Whitner, welcome to MCV and to MCV Cast. Thanks, Whitney. We're so excited to have you a part of Team MCV and officially on the ground in Helena. I'm so excited to be here in Montana. I was previously in Durango, Colorado, working for the Weiss Foundation, which is a foundation focused on protecting our public lands here in the United States and also abroad. Um, I managed their programs protecting land in Africa and Australia. And so now I'm, I'm up here in Montana and really diving into the deep end. All right. Well, we're happy to have you on board, Whitner Chase. Uh, let's get to some headlines. Federal Judge Brian Morris of Montana this week threw out a controversial rule put in place in the final days of the Trump administration. The rule limited which scientific data the Environmental Protection Agency can use in making decisions. Opponents say the old rule essentially muddied the water, preventing the best available science from guiding decisions that affect pollution, contaminants, pesticides, maybe even viruses. We got word this week that the Bureau of Land Management lost a staggering 87% of its headquarters staff after President Trump relocated the HQ to Grand Junction, Colorado. Now the question is, will President Biden move the BLM back to Washington? We also got word this week that Montana's only member of the U.S. House quietly signed a letter opposing the nominee who will oversee the BLM. Congressman Matt Rosendale was one of 15 Republicans in the House who told Biden they opposed the nomination of Congresswoman Deb Holland as Interior Secretary. Holland is the first Native American woman ever to be nominated for a cabinet position, and we believe she is highly qualified for the job. Rosendale says Holland is, quote, a direct threat to working men and women and a rejection of responsible development of America's natural resources. Well, the good news for us is only senators vote to confirm cabinet members, and Matt Rosendale isn't a senator. The congressman apparently did travel to the southern border this week, tweeting a clip in front of heavy equipment sitting idle. We're going to share it here because it's a good reminder of where our only congressman's priorities are these days. Here we are on one of the construction lay down yards with all this equipment sitting here that unfortunately is not doing work today to build the wall because of the Biden administration's new policies. At the end of this wall now is just maybe about one mile up the side of this mountain that is just going to stay open and to perpetuate the, uh, the continued illegal immigration coming into the country. Hot off the press, a new report following up on President Biden's recent order to pause oil and gas leasing on federal public lands. The report comes from our friends at Rocky Mountain Wild based in Denver. Using hard data, the report points out that while some political leaders claim this new order will impact jobs, oil and gas companies currently have millions of acres of leases on federal lands across the West. That means in Montana, the impact of President Biden's order is negligible. In our state, 1.5 million acres of federal land are currently under lease, and more than a million of those acres are not even developed. The report from Rocky Mountain Wild also includes a fascinating interactive map showing exactly where in Montana these oil and gas leases are. We have a link to it in our show notes. The results are surprising. The oil and gas industry has leases in places like the Yellowstone Club, under the Bridger Bowl ski area, and throughout the Flathead Valley. This week in Helena, the House State Administration Committee narrowly approved the legislation we discussed last week to end same-day voter registration in Montana. Lawmakers on Tuesday amended House Bill 176 to move the voting registration deadline to noon, Monday before the election day. Before that, the bill would have cut off registration the Friday before Election Day. Then the committee passed this bill with a narrow vote of 10 to 9. The bill's sponsor, Representative Sharon Grief of Florence, claims the bill is about easing the workload of clerks on Election Day. 
But Representative Marvin Weatherwax of Browning, a member of the Blackfeet tribe, didn't buy it. He says long hours for election workers on election night is part of the job. I will call this what it is, voter suppression. Speaking for my people, uh, we were we were deemed citizens of the United States in 1924. We've endured fraud, intimidation, voter tax. We've endured all of those things. Now we have this little, it, it's, it seems small, but it's big. House Bill 176 now goes to the House floor for debate, and we'll be following it closely. This week, we learned that the year 2020 was the busiest on record for Montana's 55 state parks. That's according to new data from the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. 3.4 million people visited Montana parks in 2020, a 30% increase from 2019. Overall, park visits jumped a whopping 83% over the past decade. But in Helena, state lawmakers refused a Department of Revenue request to fund Montana's new recreational marijuana program. That program is ultimately supposed to fund state parks. Montana voters approved legalizing and taxing recreational marijuana last November, with the understanding that about half the revenue would fund state-owned public lands. The House Appropriations Committee balked at the initial funding request of $1.3 million to get the program up and running. Even Governor Greg Gianforte supported that funding request. Our last episode of MCV Cast came out right as Governor Gianforte delivered his first State of the State address in Helena. The governor stuck to familiar themes during his speech, cutting regulations, cutting taxes, and somehow keeping popular services. What we noticed was what Governor Gianforte failed to mention even once, our changing climate. As for public lands, he said only this of two of his new cabinet members. I've charged Hank Worsich at FWP to build stronger, better bridges with sportsmen, landowners, and outfitters. I've charged Amanda Castor at DNRC to bring more federal lands into active forest management so we can prevent catastrophic wildfires, have healthier forests, improve wildlife habitat, and bring back some of our good-paying Montana timber jobs. That's right. Governor Gianforte failed to mention the 70,000-plus Montana jobs that rely on our public lands. For him, the priority is on harvesting more trees. One of MCV's Legislators of the Year gave the Democratic response to the governor's State of the State address. Representative Lori Bishop of Livingston is the House Minority Whip. She says her colleagues across the aisle let Montana's economic recovery fall by the wayside to focus on attacking the freedoms of Montana's women and children. And Bishop wasted no time talking about the importance of public lands. Every Montanan has the right to earn a living. And we know that thousands of Montanans earn their living thanks to this state's incredible public lands. But instead of protecting this essential economic driver, some Republicans in this building are undermining successful programs that have helped the state and private landowners to work together on land conservation. Montana Montana Democrats are fighting to defend our pristine public lands and maintain the $7 billion outdoor recreation economy that they support. Our public lands are not for sale, and they never will be. Earlier this month, in his final days in office, former U.S. Interior Secretary David Bernhardt transferred management of the National Bison Range to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. The move finally ended a painful, decades-long effort by the tribes to manage the nearly 19,000 acre refuge, which sits squarely in the boundaries of the Flathead Reservation. Today, the National Bison Range between Missoula and Polson falls under the purview of this week's guest. Rich Jansen Jr. is the head of natural resources for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Rich oversees a staff of more than 200 employees and now several hundred head of wild bison. Rich, thanks for joining us on MCV Cast, and we'd be remiss not to start this conversation with the congratulations. Well, thank you, Aaron. Um, it's good to be here. I've been very busy in these last few years uh, getting ready for what happened on December 27th. 
Yeah, we're excited to get into that. And and first, just a bit of setup for listeners who may not be entirely familiar with the history of the bison range. Uh, Long story short here, President Teddy Roosevelt created it way back in 1908, but he did it without consulting with the tribes, even though it was entirely in the boundaries of tribal land. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has managed the range until now. So the first question for you, Rich, is now that the Confederated Tribes are managing it, what does it mean exactly? Well, it it means that the 18,800 acres, almost 19,000 acres, are now back in tribal hands to where we're going to manage the bison, we're going to manage the land, um, we're going to take care of it. I mean, we were the individuals that, in my opinion, saved these majestic, beautiful creatures from extinction. And it's, you know, it's come to fruition, you know, after over 111 years of being in uh, federal hands, you know, and taken without our consent we're now going to be able to look at what is here and enhance it. It's a long time coming. You, you know, I'm a lot of people that have passed on or, uh, you know, are no longer with us or may no longer work for the tribes in any capacity. You know, they're very happy. They're very happy today. And and we're going to shine. You know, we've been managing wildlife our, our entire existence, you know, and uh, I'm just... I don't know what to tell you. It's just been an ecstatic um, time for us. And, and, you know, the honeymoon period, you know, we're kind of in that. Um, But we've been planning on this for a long time. Yeah, one of my questions was about, you have a a pretty rich history of successfully managing wildlife. Can you point to some of those other success stories and what it means for the new task at hand regarding the the bison? Oh, absolutely, Aaron. I mean, if you can go to our website, uh, it's just bisonrange.org. ORG. But to get back to our award-winning wildlife management program led by Mr. Dale Becker, um, who's been with us for over 35 years, he's been getting ready to retire here in March. But, you know, they've had a lot of successes since Dale has been here and the staff that are master's level biologists or bachelor's level biologists um, from the local schools here at the University of Montana, say it's Kootenai College or Montana State University. Um, Dale and the tribes back in the 80s, we started an elk herd in, in what is right across the river from the, the bison range right now. And that elk herd was, you know, less than 50 animals in the 80s. And now we're extending that uh, number to a population of a, over a thousand ahead of Rocky Mountain elk. And these elk, you know, they, they travel and, and we know where they travel. They go all, go all the way up through the Libyan Troy area into Canada even as far south, you know, going down to the Darby area or Hamilton, Montana, in our Salish uh, homeland um, and down into Idaho. You know, and that, that's just a testament of, of our tribe and, and what we did to, con- to really conserve this species. And now it's very plentiful here on the reservation. The other um, couple of things I want to talk to you guys about is, you know, we, in the 80s, we started a Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep herd, you know, right near the, the reservation boundary. Uh, going towards Paradise and Plains, Montana. And there was nothing there, no no Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. And now we have a herd of, you know, two to 300, even more that go back and forth off the reservation to where uh, state hunters um, covet that tag, you know, and there's only six, I believe six bighorn sheep that are allowed to be taken from that district right off the reservation and over 1200 people annually put in including myself Hmm. and i didn't get one Hmm. Um, we can look at trumpeter swan reintroduction here on the flathead indian reservation and and the great success there that dale becker really had a a strong hand in you know bringing in a, a trumpeter swans and now we're finding those very plentiful especially along the flathead river um, I don't want to tell you where they're at because a lot of people look at it. But, you know, when, when you see those those three really, really great things occur in our wildlife program, um, we know we can manage the bison range and we can enhance it. I do know I talked to the, the Fish and Wildlife uh, Refuge Manager, Amy Kaufman, um, and she said there's about 444 bison on the range right now and, and we're she said they're looking to get that number down because it's just a little bit um higher than the carrying capacity that they currently have 
So say you were to speak to a first time visitor of the range, maybe somebody not even from Montana or even the West, what would you tell them about the importance of the the bison range and, and, and the bison on it? Maybe paint a picture for folks who haven't been there. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, North American bison, um, and they're called bison um, or buffalo in the English term, um, this animal has been a very, very important part to the history and the culture of Native Americans throughout uh, North America. Um, they were they are plentiful in the hundreds of millions, I believe. And these animals have, have a deep-rooted connection with our ancestors uh, going back millennia to where they provided to, to us, you know, for subsistence and to live. And we also provided to them where we didn't over-harvest or everything that we took was utilized. And you can go back in history and, and show that this 19,000 acres that was in the heart of the Flathead Indian Reservation, you know, was taken out without consent. And it's just one of those things that we would tell individuals that come here that might not know the history that, yeah, you're on an Indian reservation. You're on what was once tribal land taken away for 111 years, now back in tribal hands. Um, and that these animals are very dear to us. So this bill, this this law, took an act of Congress, of course, and we're pleased to say it was a bipartisan one at that. But of course, it took a whole lot of work by people like you to get to that point. Walk us through what that looked like over the past, well, I, what was it 1970s since there was an active effort to regain management back? Yes. What, what, what was that like? Well, I mean, I've been in management of natural resources, you know, I can say my entire life. And you can go back to when I was a kid. I didn't know we had a bison range. I didn't know that was part of our, our history. You know, even living in Ronan, um, we just didn't know. And it wasn't until I got into college at the University of Montana that I realized what had been done. And, and there's so many people, a lot of people that have passed on. Um, Pat Pierre, a great uh, Calespe or Ponderay elder, um, he passed away a few years ago. Louis Adams, a great Salish elder, um, and many others. Uh, Mickey Pablo, a former chairman of the tribes back in 1994 when we were really started pushing to get back management of the bison ranch. He passed away, you know, and he was a young man, I think, in the early 40s. Um, and he passed away, but it, it was difficult, you know, but you know, over time, you know, when this water compact started being talked about almost 10 years ago and, and what the state knew and we knew and the feds knew we had to get done in order to uh, prevent um, years or decades of, uh, of litigation that would have just got the attorneys um, richer. Um, they came to a, an agreement that took a long time to get to. A lot of public meetings where, you know, our people would just take the brunt of hatred, of racism, um, of just downright unknown. These people didn't know us, so they, they feared what they didn't know. You know, a lot of this came from off the reservation, you know, and I remember being in Helena in, in 2015 and just listening to almost 12 hours of testimony, you know, against the tribes for whatever reason. It was just, it was unfathomable. You know, and still to hear some of those same stereotypes today was just ridiculous. And, you know, and, and to not understand what our cultural relevance is to this animal or to the water or to the natural resources in general was tough to take sometimes, but you got to be professional, you know. And, and I've been in this, this role as the department head for almost uh, 11 years now. And one thing I've learned is not everybody is going to like you. You know, not everybody is going to agree with where you want to go. And sometimes it just takes time. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort by a lot of people, uh, including our tribal councils, past and present, our legal departments, our allies, a lot of nonprofits that came to our defense um, to say, yes, we can do this. And we're proven at it. You know, there, there's no reason to, 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 to be scared about what we're going to do. But there was times there, and I'll tell you, where I wanted to say something, you know, and then I'd even have friends of mine saying, Rich, why aren't you saying something? Rich, why, why aren't you getting mad? I said, man, I've heard this all before. You know, it just rolls off my sleeve anymore. I mean, they're going to say what they're going to say. 
there's not a lot that I can do to change their mind except talk to them. And half the time they don't want to talk. Their mind's already made up. I mean, but, you know, it, it came through. And, and I know there's still people upset out there. You know, we know it. I mean, look at the political climate that we're in now. You know, we're going to shine. You know, I know there's people out there that want to see us fail in, in whatever that may be. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, Aaron, but I, I could tell you that our tribe could solve the, or get a cure for cancer and they would they would say something's wrong or you can't do it. I mean, it just it got to that point. It really did. But anymore, we're. We're, we're moving forward. You know, we're, we're moving forward with the transition with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. We got a good rapport with them. Um, I, I believe they knew this was coming over the last 10 years. And, you know, we're, we're in that transition phase right now where we're working with their staff that have been impeccable. There's even tribal members that work down there now for the federal government. And, and you know, it's been wonderful. So things are going well, Aaron. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Just, uh, I mean, one of the the questions I had was about the organized opposition to this uh, for a long time. And you're right, they're kind of on the sidelines now. But if you were to speak with somebody who would give you the time to just listen to what you have to say, what would be the bottom line message? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line message, Aaron, would be that we can do it. It's here now. We're going to do it. And we'd love to have positive uh, individuals that that want to come in and listen to us and see see what we have to offer in terms of, of managing the bison range. Um, because it's not just the animals, you got to manage the people. You know, you got to manage the dust that'll be created um, by a lot of people coming and going. You know, it's not without its problems, obviously. But, but yeah, I mean, we just offer to come on in, have a cup of coffee or whatever you drink and sit down, and visit with us. I mean, we're transparent. You know, we're going to be transparent and, and we're going to showcase what we can do. Um, I'm not saying the feds did a, a bad job on the bison range. It's just that our voice really wasn't heard or put into their uh, information that they shared. I mean, only in the last 10 years have, have really have the tribes been able to uh, um, stake a claim or put a footprint into uh, the bison range, as you see today. And, and we look to improve that because a lot of their buildings out there are dated. They were uh, brand new in 1981 when I think I was in fifth grade and Reagan had just gotten elected. <laughs> you can go way back. Anything else that you'd like to add, Rich? Um, you know, Aaron, it's it just it just great uh, that this finally came to fruition. Um, I did an interview about four years ago on NPR that said, in my lifetime, you will see this happen. You know, and we were so close under the Obama administration and that got taken away. Um, by then, Department of Interior, I forgot his name, but, you know, he, he was a was a SEAL, you know, a congressman in Montana, um, that he took that away due to when the Trump administration came in. And, you know, over, over time, it just, you know, kind of a perfect storm, you know, that uh, it's going to be a, a great experience for somebody that might not know what the bison range is when they come here because we know we're smack dab in the middle of glacier park and yellowstone park and you get millions of visitors every year that come through montana we we see it in the summers uh, when the population you know quadruples and, and the, the highway cars are just there's just so many you know and and those people that live here you know we're we also want to show them you know, what they have not seen, even from living here. I mean, I've had many friends, a lot of older uh, friends that, that I may know that are, you know, they, they're happy that we got it back. A lot of people think it should have stayed in tribal hands, you know, but a lot of people might not realize is that no money comes with it. No federal money comes with it to manage the bison range. So we're going to have to look at uh, creative ways um, to um, keep the revenue flowing um, so that we can continue to manage it and improve uh, the, the surrounding bison range. So we're, we're looking forward to the, uh, the challenge, and, and it's finally here for all the ancestors that um, before me that have passed on to the, to the seven generations that we manage our, our resources for that are coming. Um, that they will be able to say this is theirs. Um, the, I mean, we don't look at land in terms of ownership, like the capitalistic society. 
we borrow it from our ancestors and, and it's here and we keep it better for the next generation. I mean, it's priceless. There's, there's no amount of money or monetary value that you can put on having back the bison ranch. Rich Jansen Jr. is the head of the Department of Natural Resources for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Rich, congrats again. Good luck and um, thanks for joining us on MCV Cast. Thank you very much, Aaron. The views of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of MCV, its staff, or its board of directors. Montana Conservation Voters has, however, weighed in multiple times with Congress in strong support of the tribe's management of the National Bison Range. We're keeping an eye on a major piece of legislation in Washington that would affect voting rights, campaign finance, and election transparency across America. House Bill 1 is called the For the People Act. Maryland Democrat John Sarbanes introduced the bill, which he calls a transformational anti-corruption and clean elections reform package. There is a solution. We just got to get behind it and make sure that it gets done. Hold us to it. Make us follow through. It's your democracy. We are just the instrument of your will. And so we have to deliver on the promises we're making. The For the People Act is a sweeping 800-page bill that would require automatic voter registration across the country. It would enhance absentee voting, end partisan gerrymandering, reform campaign finance, including transparency and dark money. We have a link to all the details in our show notes. While the future of HR1 is uncertain, we're curious to know what you think about the bill. Drop us a line at mcv at mtvoters.org. Senator John Tester this week publicly weighed in support of the Keystone XL pipeline. Tester has long supported KXL, and this week he sent a letter to the president asking him to reconsider the decision to revoke the permit. Tester says he believes, quote, we can make adjustments to the proposed project that will provide even stronger protections for people and clean water, while still supporting jobs and economic development. Senator Tester's letter is an example of where Montana conservation voters disagrees with the senior U.S. senator. MCV remains staunchly opposed to the Keystone XL pipeline. But as you can imagine, not everyone agrees that Keystone is a net economic gain for Montana. As veteran political reporter Mike Dennison noted this past week, Mike interviewed our own Whitney Taney for his story about impacts of President Biden's shutdown of KXL. And we'll leave you today with a snippet. And we'll be back next week. They should be taking actions to protect our climate, our environment, our water, our public lands. Our economy here in Montana is largely driven by that outdoor recreation economy. And tribes on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation say the pipeline threatens their water supply and that its workforce could be...